David, do you want to tell me first off what you're doing at the Tamania bull sale today? Okay, uh, at the sale today, I'm I'm here because I uh, a long time ago wrote a book about the issue of um, methane emissions from livestock, and I researched that matter and I uh, have written a book um, pointing out that some of the things that we get told about the methane are not really given in a, in a full context of what the methane really is. The Wilding family here um, have purchased quite a few of those books individually. They like the story and they've been promoting me uh, very graciously and uh, sending books to other farmers and all that sort of stuff. And I was then invited to come across to this sale and with the opportunity of selling some books, which I've done. So we brought over 80 books in the plane and we're hoping to take back uh, uh, an empty case, isn't it? No books and two dozen New Zealand reds. The big sales will happen when the when the um, when the sale is over. But yeah, we're selling it constantly all day today. So maybe at this stage we can take it back half a dozen reds. But hopefully in the next hour or so we'll be able to take it back more than that. So can you take me through, I guess, the main points of what you were telling the guys uh, sitting in the crowd here earlier, and I guess the main points of your book as well? Well, the main point of the book is that I'm a, um, a journalist and I edited a magazine, and some years ago, about five or six years ago, we were getting a constant barrage um, on television, newspapers and all the rest of it, how bad cattle were, how terrible the methane was, how global warming effect the multiple of methane. And I actually started to become a little bit guilty or, or have a slight guilt and it, it influenced me and I was thinking, well, you know, I, I'm, uh, I wonder if I'm in a good industry or not. This is, like, this is like being in the tobacco industry. And so I thought, well, I need to research it just so that I know what I'm talking about when this issue comes up. I quickly came to the conclusion, uh, just to shorten it a little bit, that every single atom of carbon that a cow emits after it's eaten grass Every single atom of carbon came from the atmosphere in the first place. It doesn't come from the ground, it comes from the atmosphere because there's, there's carbon dioxide up there, it uh, gets turned, by photosynthesis in plants, it gets turned into plant material. The cow eats the plant material, digests it and uses it in its body process and gives it out in the form of carbon dioxide and methane. And the methane eventually in the atmosphere, meth methane's unstable in the presence of oxygen and it actually converts to a carbon dioxide molecule which is the same as what it was before the photosynthesis and some water and so the whole thing is a, a closed cycle so that you can stand at the top of a, a, a chimney stack at a coal fire station and argue about whether that carbon dioxide is heating the earth because it's new carbon dioxide and it's from fossil fuel which has been there for millions of years. You can have an argument about that. You can't really have the same argument about livestock because every molecule they breathe out, uh, belch out, comes from the atmosphere. So there's no additional carbon load created by the life of a cow or 20 cows or 100 cows or a million cows. Okay. So why is it important to get that message across to people that are here today? Okay, why it became important to me is that I, um, I'm a sensitive little thing and I, um, I sort of just felt offended uh, that, hold it, you know, people are telling me all this stuff and when you look into it, it's only part of the truth. It's only, they're only telling part of the story and they're not telling the, the story in the whole context. So I, I, I suppose... I. I I don't get angry, but I, I, I thought that's just terrible what, what's happening and I'm being exploited, that's what I thought, and I just want to, uh, to write a story and, and, and campaign for the opposite point of view. And, and I'll add too, it's not just a question of whether or not there's any extra carbon load to the atmosphere. One of the things that um, cattle can do, and, 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 and sheep, ruminant animals generally, if they're correctly grazed and managed, they can actually draw down extra carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, you know, the load of carbon that we've put up there since the Industrial Revolution, uh, yeah, since the Industrial Revolution, we can, those animals can draw that down by photosynthesis and put it in the ground and store it in the ground. And photosynthesis is the only way we know how to take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. And so the, the farmers shouldn't be vilified by the environmental movement. The farmers should be the heroes of the environmental movement. 
absolutely. Okay, so one of the one of the things I'm thinking just listening to this is that a massive local issue that we've got here, aside from this one, is the fact that Canterbury rivers are being um, poisoned or whatever, you know, completely just full of filth from livestock. Yeah. Have you heard anything about that? or? I have heard uh, a bit about it, but, but it's, uh, and I know your viewers don't want to hear about Australia all the time necessarily, but it, it is an issue in Australia, it's a big issue, and it's been an issue for quite some years. So a lot of farmers in Australia, and I'm sure it's happening here, are fencing off their riparian zones, and there are government uh, incentives to do this. So they fence off the riparian zones, and also where they can they'll put the, the water points for, for cattle up on the higher ground uh, in trees and things if they can so that the cattle go up to the high ground, drink water, sit there, dung and urine there that, and, and then as that, uh, those nutrients and things wash down downhill it actually provides nutrients to downhill. Then down in the riparian zone uh, the grasses and things are all growing busily away and they absorb things getting into the uh, to the water and the benefit in Australia is not just that we have cleaner water the benefit is that we restore our water courses and um, stop erosion stop water erosion that's a terrible problem in Australia so uh, they're the solutions that are being done in Australia and that's the solutions that are being done by some of the case studies that I, I, I develop in this book um, and and that's again one of the reasons why the, the farmers should be the environmentalist heroes not the villains. Is it just a case of not being able to please everybody or is it a case of farmers having to give a little bit and you know sort of help the environment or? Um, well I, I think farmers are giving a lot but, but it's, it's not just a question of giving because it's a type of giving that I think um, is one of those things where you get back more than you give um, and if you change your livestock uh, practices and change your grazing patterns in Australia and fix your rivers and things and stop erosion, your actual farming productivity of, on the land that you're using um, increases dramatically. And, and as again, case studies in here, or cases that I cite, um, the, the, the productivity in terms of um, cattle production or meat production can go up two and a half times and you're still not overgrazing the land. And you're having more frogs, more insects, more birds, more this, that and the other thing than it used to be there where the land was degraded. Um, so it's education? Well it's education. Uh, the exciting thing that's happening in Australia is that the, it is the farmers who are educating each other. It's, it's changed from the grassroots up. Um, uh, there's plenty of farmers who are not, not necessarily joining in, that, that's true, but um, farmers are seeing it and in every district there's some farmer who's made these changes and has reversed things and and so slowly various other farmers start to see that and for a lot of a lot of farming families in Australia there's been that that moment when you sit at the kitchen table with your wife and maybe after three generations of farming and say this is not working we're going to go broke if we keep on doing this you know, because there's farms there in Australia, in the arid places, where you've got 50% bare ground. So if you think you've got a farm of 1,000 hectares, it's only 500 hectares, really. And if you, you know, and, and so these people, the, the, the pressure for change doesn't come from the government so much, it comes from the farmers themselves. Um, let's change, we've got to change something, otherwise we're just going to be, we're going to be out of here. Interesting topic, we could go on for hours, but unfortunately we've got to leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tanya. Thank you.